Pet Right, Disability Rights Leadership Series, 1999-2000, a project of Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, DREDF, with access video, University of San Francisco. We certainly, the, the Republicans that we've talked to so far said, you know, the world began with me. I mean, that's an overstatement. but. They certainly didn't have any sense of the confluence of things that were happening in mm -hmm. the country that made the time right for Republicans and Democrats to mm -hmm. come together. What's mm -hmm. your sense of that? Um, I think it, it played a lot. Um, I mean, there's there's what was happening in, in the context of disability, but also what was happening in the context of the country also. Um, Bush ran on a platform of kinder, gentler and he had nothing um, right before the Republican convention had nothing to put forth to say to explain to the press what he meant by kinder gentler um, and so Evan Kemp was able and Boyden were able to pitch to him that the ADA would be an example of something kinder gentler um, and so that's essentially how um, Bush got from my position to endorse the ADA. They might have said something differently about it. When the original piece of legis, uh, the original draft came out of the National Council, it was jokingly referred to as the Flat Earth Act. Um, I was really clear that that could never pass Congress. Um, and again, primarily because we had just come from four years of teaching them the definition of what disability was, having them learn what 504 was because of overturning the Grove City decision. So that when you, although it was legally and technically accurate how it was drafted, um, the concept of saying private industry should have a more strict standard than someone who receives federal financial assistance was, you know, almost impossible to even conceptualize. One of the things that we were picking up in the halls of Congress is that people really didn't understand um, that it was difficult for people with disabilities to live and exist in the community. So I had, although they had four years of legal education around the, the overturning of the Grove City decision, they didn't have any kind of cultural experience of why a civil rights piece of legislation would be needed. So by asking people to take a day out of their life and just write down the number of things that they can't do in their community or they didn't do today because their community was so inaccessible and send that diary of discrimination to their member of Congress, it would accomplish my two goals. One is to educate the members about their local people in their local areas that they represented, and two, empower the disabled individuals around the country to care about wanting to pass a much greater law. Justin was actually, Justin Dart Jr. was actually key in that. He traveled the country encouraging people to write these diaries um, and to document, to send a copy to him and as well as to send a member of Congress. And then when Justin actually testified before the law, we had bags and bags, uh, postal bags filled with copies of the diaries because one of the things that always happens in the Hill is the members of Congress always say, well, we never heard from anybody. My job was to keep an eye on the entire picture um, to kind of make sure that um, the community stayed together as a, as a unit um, to um, tap into who, if we needed, if we were arguing a certain area, who was the expert in that area that we could bring in. So I, I think the personal relationships are the key to making the whole act work. Um, I think had we not built up trust between the civil rights community and the disability community, we would not be viewed as a civil rights issue. Um, had we, you know, Evan Kemp not had trust built up with Boyd and Gray um, and the president, that could not have been transferred to Arlene Mayerson and myself uh, for him to talk to us. Um, had we not worked for years with the Justice Department from 504 on, um, 
I think, you know, people kind of knew that that we knew what we were talking about. Um, we weren't. It wasn't just a shuck and jive routine. That it really was based upon some experience and some fact. Um, and I think our relationship with um, both Senator Kennedy and Senator Harkin and um, Tony Coelho originally, Senator Weicker, were critical for you know the key passage and that when uh, Coelho left he transferred that over to Hoyer um, and you know said these are my people trust them you know they'll be honest with you and and I think had that not happened there never could be a, an act. Uh, over the hump parts where uh, the Kennedy Sununu meeting was critical for me um, the second critical part was the House negotiation. Um, and the third critical part was um, the Chapman Amendment, the AIDS Food Handler Amendment. The negotiations be between the White House and the Senate um, broke down. And it wasn't until Senator Kennedy stepped in um, and Attorney General Thornburg and Kennedy um, essentially escorted Mr. Sununu out of Mr. Kennedy's office. Why that meeting is critical is that when when Sununu started screaming at Bobby Silverstein um, and Kennedy leapt up and said, no one talks to Senate, you, you may talk to the White House that way and I hope you don't, but no one talks to the Senate staff that way, especially in my office, get out. Um, at that point, um, I think that's when Kennedy really got um, owned the piece of legislation. Um, so I, that to me I think was a turning point really for um, Kennedy making sure that he wasn't going to have any of these games played um, and that he was really going to be kind of like fathering whatever Harkin was going to do with this legislation. We were still trying to get a written letter from the president to say that he endorsed the legislation. And Kennedy was stalling the markup because he wanted to read it into the record because that was all part of the plan. And um, the letter never, never came up. And so I was on the phone in the back room screaming at Boyden saying, where's the letter, where's the couple expletive letters and senator kind of looked at me and said well there she is doing her work it walked out he said let me know when you get the letter um but that was about we never got the letter um this was a last ditch attempt um he was congressman douglas wasn't happy with bartlett's um bartlett's negotiation of covering people with mental illness we had a long history with mental illness when we did the fair housing amendments um, they tried to bar people with mental illness from protections under fair housing because, you know, what we all know, people with mental illness burn down their houses, so that's why they shouldn't be allowed to live anywhere but an institution. Um, but it was, uh, and they also rape women in the parking lot. So um, we had to get over that. Um, and so we, we beat them on that. And then when they got to, the ADA and they realized that people who were mental illness were now going to be protected in employment. Um, it was right after one of the postal sprees. Um, so Douglas came out with his little gun and literally pointed right at you. And, and it was a dear colleague. It's the first dear colleague I've ever seen that was, you know, with a picture on it. And it was this gun pointing right at you. And you looked up the barrel of the gun and it said what um, Mary Lou just read. Which was? Um, essentially, you know, this will protect berserk people from uh, in your workplace and enable that people with guns to remain in your workplace, implying that all mentally ill people bought guns to work. Um, so that was, again, that was, you know, one of the SWAT teams that had to go out where we had to do, you know, the write down of people, most of the people who um, go quote unquote berserk in the workplace have little or no hist prior history of mental illness um, so it necessarily wouldn't be covered um, and of course the ADA didn't guarantee you to bring your gun and shoot your um, fellow employees that wasn't one of the rights granted under the law um, shucks um, so it, it's that kind of 
you know, issues. But again, it was a scare tactic. It was a scare tactic to get people to not let the ADA go through because people realized that the train was moving out and it had mentally ill people on it and we were moving out of the station rapidly. Um, so this was the last ditch effort to try and, uh, and delay it. Interestingly, Mr. Douglas didn't get a lot of support for his position, nor did he get a lot of people on his dear colleague. Um, but it, it did, it, you know, all of these things like the AIDS thing or the mental illness thing, all, you know, rattled. It was an earthquake within the disability community, you know. Um, maybe we should do an amendment to say mentally ill people can't bring guns to work. And so I would say things, oh, so does that mean fat people can? You know, I mean, what, what, what are we saying here, you know? Um, and that if we're going to do any amendments, we do an amendment that says nobody can bring a gun. Um, and so these kind of eruptions constantly kind of tested the coalition and the ability to stay together. You know, the, the, the last part was really the Chapman Amendment where um, we all of a sudden got a food handlers. And remember, I said one of the premises that we negotiated this bill was all for one and one for all, and you didn't just kick people out. So when that went, fell apart, it was kind of really horrible. And at that time, uh, we went and met with Boyden. And I remember it was um, about, I put together a meeting of, of about 15 disability leaders and Tim McFeely out of the Human Rights Campaign Fund. And we went in to talk to Boyden about it because the irony of it is President Bush had just given a speech, which we had copies of on World, World's Aid Days, World's Aid, World's, World AIDS Day, in which he said you couldn't get AIDS from handling food. But here they were not coming out against this amendment. And I remember um, Bob Williams was sitting next to, to the right of Boyden in the Roosevelt Room. And um, Boyden was one, at one end of the table and I was at the other end. And all these people sat, you know, along the, the either side of the table. And Bob spelled out um, in his, on his speaking machine that he understood what it was like to be kicked out of restaurants because of the way you looked or the way people thought you were and that as a child he was kicked out of many restaurants for having cerebral palsy with his family and that he wanted to know wanted Boyden to know that it ain't civil and it ain't right to do what they were doing and it, um, at that time Tim McFeely just burst into tears um, and that was the end of the meeting. They didn't change their position, but it was a great kind of unifying meeting, you know, from the community. And McFeely later said that he had never had an experience before where the where any community argued on behalf of people who were gay, you know, to an administration where normally he has to bring up the topic whenever he's in any meeting. And in this case, he said nothing during the whole meeting except cry. During the Chapman Amendment discussion, John Lewis, who was an original freedom writer, um, was the guy who stood on the floor to the Republicans and said, you know, I, I know discrimination and this is discrimination. Um, when you don't allow somebody in based upon the color of their skin or, you know, them testing positive for a disease, that's discrimination. On the same issue, we had a press conference on the Senate Human Rights Campaign Fund. Karen Friedman did a great um, out to lunch. The Restaurant Association, she uh, it was the out to lunch bunch. She got brown lunch bags and put a copy of the front of the legislation glued onto it. And it was filled with information about HIV and food handling. And they delivered it to every room. Um, and we did a presentation at the um, at a press conference in the Senate hearing room, and the, the airline associate flight attendants union union was there because they had a lot of flight attendants who are HIV who would lose their job because they handle food. Um, some of the restaurant unions were there, um, and at that time I made a statement that we would um, take down the bill rather than. Um, hold on to that amendment to the press. So that was a pretty powerful statement. 
Um, I think everybody was shocked in the community um, as to whether I actually would have done it or not. What was your problem? Um, I think the passage in the Senate, actually first time, first vote, um, it really was, um, Senator Kennedy called me out and we went for a walk, um, and then we came back and they cast the final vote. And, I, and it really... I think it really was kind of this realization that it actually was happening. Um, we were plagued by pedophiles and, you know, um, whatever. Um, Orrin Hatch had had this amendment at the end about, you know, taking out a whole bunch of people. Um, and so there was this kind of like it's on, it's off, it's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. And then finally the final vote came. And, you know, it, it was more like I, I really, I think, wasn't sure that ever in my lifetime I would see civil rights for people with disabilities. Um, the second really kind of moving thing was for me sitting at the signing ceremony. I sat next to Kennedy and um, the senator leaned over to me and said, you know, something about um he had a horrible d dream last night and i said oh what was that sir and he said um i dreamt that bush read the bill and <laughs> he wouldn't sign it <laughs> normally when you do a signing ceremony for a piece of legislation the president is generally flanked by both uh, democrats and republicans who participated in the passage or were key to the passage of the bill the Republicans wanted nothing to do with the Democrats being a part of it or being surrounding it. And so they um, they kept everybody off the podium with the exception of Howard Wilkie, who was a, a minister, um, Justin Dart, and Sandy Perino. And so there were no members of Congress wrapping the half moon behind him. They wouldn't even let the Democrats sit in the front row below them. They had them cordoned off in a, in a different area. And so normally when the president signs, he signs with his pen and he signs part of a letter and he hands a pen and so that he has a number of pens to hand out. Well, no Democrat got a, a pen for the signing of the ADA, um, which is also unheard of. And so um, Dick Thornburg heard that I hadn't gotten anything um, for the ADA, so when he signed the ADA regulations when they first came out, he signed them with a pen and mailed me a pen and said, this is because you didn't get, you know, anything, a, a signing pen for the ADA. So I sent him a note, personal note back saying, how do I know you signed the regulations with this? So he sent me an affidavit which is stamped with the Attorney General's seal certifying that that was the official pen signing the regulations for the ADA. We really have changed the lives of people with disabilities um, and really have taken, you know, put an end to second class citizenship, at least on paper. Um, 50 years from now, if you're watching this tape, you should know that um, what we did appeared to be revolutionary, even though those who did it thought it was just an incremental step. Um, so um, the work is up to you guys 50 years from now. Is there anything you can share that is of a personal nature that you're willing to share? No. I still work here in this town. <laughs>
The Disability Rights Leadership Series owes a debt of gratitude to the individuals who agreed to be interviewed and without whose passion and dedication the ADA would not have become law. The series would not have come about without the vision of Pat Wright, longtime director of governmental affairs for DREDF, and Arlene Mayerson, DREDF's directing attorney, who conceptualized the series and the interview themes. Thanks goes to the University of San Francisco for sponsoring the project that included the Disability Rights Leadership Series, and the Bancroft Library, University of California, Berkeley, for accepting an archival copy of the unedited interviews and providing a safe and permanent home for the collection. The series would not have been possible without funding from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. A list of the interviewees and links to their interviews can be found at dreadf.org. 2015.